Hello and welcome to part two in this video series. If you haven't seen part one, I recommend checking that out first before moving on to this video. Part one is a, an introduction to grid trading and is it profitable. So in today's video part two, I'm going to be talking about what pairs work best for grid trading, uh, back testing, how to develop a strategy so it uh, has the best chance of, at profiting in the future. I think that the things I am going to say in this video will be some of the most important things I'll ever say on this channel, uh, my YouTube channel here. So hopefully you can enjoy what's next. All right, so let's go over the best pairs for grid trading techniques. I've got my, got my cat here. <laughs> All right, so the Ranger algorithm, which is my personally built algorithm, uh, specifically trades just two pairs, which is the pound Canadian dollar and the Aussie Canadian dollar. And I found that these pairs were really reactive to candlestick patterns and also grid trading money management. And as you can see here, this is uh, out of sample data going back to January 7th of 2020. So you can see that the, the strategy is, is really capable on these two pairs. I also have 16 months of out of sample data here ranging from tw October 24th, 2019 to current date. All right, so it shows that the strategy uh, has been really successful in out of sample data. So what I originally did was I built the strategy uh, within sample data, trading the past. Now, you basically, that's what every trader tries to do is we base our trading techniques, our strategies, and how profitable we may be in the future. All this is based on back test data, right? And pretty much everything that we do in trading is based on previous patterns with the hope that these patterns will, will repeat themselves in the future. So when I built this strategy back about eight years ago, I wanted to find a pattern in the market that was uh, repeatable and the market reacted to it on a pretty consistent basis and also uh, was capable of using grid trading techniques on as well. And I was able to kind of marry the two ideas into one strategy and that's when the, the Ranger was built. And I thought that if I could find a strategy and build a strategy that was profitable for 10 plus years of, of previous history, then I had a really good chance at profiting in the future. And I was able to prove that uh, and have and, con and continue to with the Ranger strategy with out of sample data, as you can see here, that was based on these back, uh, back tests in sample data uh, tests that I ran. And so it sh goes to show that back testing is incredibly important with any strategy that you're building. Most traders think that three to maybe even five years of back test data, data is the maximum. I find most traders only doing one to three years of back testing with their strategy. And the reason why they only do that long of data is because it's time consuming. It's difficult, it's difficult work. And uh, most traders just don't give you the advice that the more data that, you, data that you can actually pull, the better and more rounded your strategy will be in the future. What I'm gonna be saying in this segment is probably the, one of the most important things I'll ever say on this, on this channel. Uh, this will help you in developing your strategy, whether uh, it's an, an EA, a manual trading uh, technique, uh, or even using my Ranger in pinpoint algorithms. You'll see how this kind of pulls together uh, to give you a bigger, broader picture of how to increase your chances of becoming a long-term profitable trader. All right, so the first example that I'm going to give you is a one-year back test. Okay. So these ranges here, or this channel that you're looking at, this is basically the strategy failing. So if the strategy hits these peaks right up here, or the hits the bottom here, that means the strategy has failed. And you, uh, at a total loss, or you know, if it's a stop loss strategy, you hit a stream of losses that cause you to hit that barrier of your account and you get margined out, okay? So this is a one-year back test, and we didn't margin out. We the strategy was able to trade profitably within the means of of what the limits are of the strategy. So at this point, when we hit this peak right here, this was a pretty heavy drawdown of maybe 70% in our one-year back test. But we still want to try to use that data to see. Well, let's see how that one-year back test does in a th uh, the back test data does in a three-year back test. 
So we're using the, the criteria within our system, the methodology, the strategy. Uh, we're going to run a three-year backtest based on the settings that we had on that one-year backtest. And we find that the strategy margin calls or has extreme losses at points during the three-year backtest. If we expand even further and we do a 10-year backtest based on the one-year data, <clears throat> we find that it's having huge losses more, even more often. So we're finding that the more, the longer that we run our backtest data with the strategy, we're, the more weak points we're finding within it. So the next example is a five-year backtest. So this is in sample data. So this is a, just trading the past, finding what works, right? And we see that our strategy got really close to failing multiple times, three times, right, in our five-year in sample data. So when we do a five-year out of sample data, we, since it got so close in our in sample data, when we do out of sample data, we hit even closer to margining out. We're basically to the point of the strategy failing entirely. Um, and it's because our five-year back test was not as clean as we hope. We don't want it to be hitting the extremes or getting close to being uh, to, to failing. Otherwise, if it's too close to, to failing too many times, one, two, three, that means it's going to hit that limit more times, one, two, three, four. So how we want our back test data to look is we want it to look uh, something like this, where we're in, we're not getting close to these uh, blown account limits, where we're, we're trading within those uh, limits with lower drawdown during that entire period of 17 years, where we have one point that our drawdown was high, whether that's you know 30, 50 percent, or something like that, where there was one point. But if our strategy in our long-term back test of in-sample data only hit that high draw drawdown just once or maybe twice in a 17-year period, that means that our out-of-sample data will have a better chance at being successful. Uh, because we're not hitting, we didn't hit that drawdown, that high drawdown peak a bunch of times in our in sample data. So, this is more like what a uh, out of sample uh, trading would look like on a five year, uh, a five year test here. Okay, so we have it staying within our means, low drawdown, low drawdown, and then we have a peak that hit here of higher drawdown. Okay, and we had another one right here. So, Typically, I find that out of sample data will show, um, will basically test the limits of your strategy even more. So, if you're having it peak out a high drawdown multiple times in your 17 year back test, then it's probable that you're going to hit those peaks again in the future. So, limiting the amount that your strategy hits those uh, high drawdown peaks uh, is really, really important for developing it's to trade profitably in the future. Okay, so this is what we're looking at for overfit an overfitting example. So this is what I've been kind of hitting on already. So this is when your strategy is hitting the limits over and over and over again. Okay, so when your strategy is basically peaking out and almost bursting or blowing up uh, or having huge streams of losses during these times and almost margining out but barely getting out alive, if your back test data is showing periods of high, dry, high, high drawdown too often, then it's going to be overfit. It's going to be uh, over optimized, uh, or you're going to be using too much overfit data, uh, which is in turn going to cause your strategy to hit its higher peaks of drawdown more often in at a sample data or at walk forward analysis. Okay, so. We don't want that. We want our strategy to look more like it did on the last example, where the data is not hitting the peaks of high drawdown very often. And that is how you develop a good strategy and backtest. And the longer that you can run your backtest, the more data that you can pull. So for example, I was able, one of my strategies, I was able to pull 25,000 or log 25,000 trades uh, with the strategy. And that's a lot of trades to stay under, uh, you know, 
the peak drawdown, which happened to be on this on this test, was 50%. But it only hit 50% drawdown one time in its 17-year test. So that means that the majority of the time, 90-95% of the time, we're going to be under, a, we're going to be in a really low drawdown because we're basing our strategy, we're optimizing our strategy based on the very worst time of that our in-sample data gave us. So we want to make sure that we're properly developing our strategies uh, so we're not overfitting them to to the past. And, uh, and this is a pretty good example for that. When our strategy is on the verge of breaking too often in our back test sample, that it means that our future trading will likely hit high drawdown multiple times as well, resulting in losses or even blown accounts. Okay, so the typical trader out there will do uh, a one to three risk reward ratio. Uh, so that typically means a 1% stop loss and a 3% take profit uh, on a single order. I find that the majority of traders out there typically use this money management technique. Um, I think it's somewhat limiting. Um, and uh, I, I'd like to try to think outside the box so I'm not so confined to what the majority are doing. The issue here uh, is losing streaks, uh, even with this one to three risk reward. And the thing is, is when people are trading, they're thinking, well, if I cut my losses short and uh, let my profits ride, then I'll have a better chance at profiting over the long term because I'm cutting those losses uh, when they should be, which is shorter. I'm not letting them ride out. Um, and I have explored this type of money management for a really long time now and can't find a strategy that can work with a one to three risk reward ratio uh, longer than three years. And in, this is even in, in sample data. Uh, and so it, show, it shows to me over the years that this money management technique of one, a risk one to three is not as good as people saying it are, it, it's saying it is. Um, and I'd, like, I'd love to see somebody show me uh, one to two years of out of sample data using a one to three risk reward um, ratio. You know, it's possible. I've seen traders do it. But the problem is, is when these traders go on losing streaks of one to five trades, um, they, that's, that's somewhat normal, right? To have a losing streak like that. But most traders don't prepare for a 10 to 20 losing streak that will happen. These are more rare events, but people don't plan for them in their strategies. And what happens is the trader can't really bounce back from that losing streak uh, because it's, it's hit them so hard on their account, they're emotionally dis distressed, their account's hurting, and now they have to make back all those losses with a ho hopefully with a win streak um, that can cause uh, the account to be in better health. But I've seen it before where traders will have uh, a great year and then they'll have a stream of losses the next year and then causing them to just basically have to make back the loss for the whole entire next year. And you know, this is something that I have experienced with my pinpoint algorithm, taking a loss on that. Uh, but I'm able to make back this loss uh, in a likely three to four month period, which is in line with what most traders should, which, which is in line with what's respectable uh, for making back losses. But if you're spending too long and trying to make you back your losses, it's emotionally challenging uh, to do that over the long term. Okay, so the last part here is uh, what, what if we used just 0.1% on each of our trades but took 10 of them with a smaller take profit? So my idea is taking smaller trades uh, with lower risk, with smaller take profits, uh, will allow us to get in and out of the trades faster because you guys know that it's easier to profit one pip in the forex market rather than two. And so take profits that are smaller will always get hit uh, sooner and faster. And the same goes for stop losses as well. So if your stop loss is tight uh, with a risk reward ratio of one to, th uh, to 3%, if your stop loss is smaller in pip amount, then you're likely going to get hit with more losses uh, because of that. It's just how the, uh, the, the markets work uh, when it comes to, uh, to risk. So it's important that you are more flexible with your trades uh, and the quantity and because this may give you less risk overall and give you a safer long-term profit.
So that's how I approach the market, is I look for smaller take profit amounts with smaller trade sizes, but make them, uh, but trade more often. So I'm more frequent with how I approach my trades. Um, so I can still not put all of my eggs into one basket with, the, with this, this type of risk reward ratio. Now, a lot of you guys know that my pinpoint strategy has uh, suffered a loss and it had more of a uh, all or nothing type of trade system where it's basing its uh, profitability off of one single trade. And I feel like that is how most stop loss strategies uh, go and it's very limiting in how they can uh, adapt to the market uh, because then you're strictly working with win percentage and uh, how that and win percentage may be affected in, in the future, in future trading. Okay, so that's pretty much all I wanted to go over in this video today, guys. Uh, I wanted to talk about, actually before I, I end here, I wanted to go over the pairs that work best for grid trading. And the reason why is because these two pairs, the pound Canadian dollar and the Aussie CAD, uh, react to candlestick patterns very, very well. And they also are pretty volatile. So, for example, I'm looking for price to have big pullbacks of a substantial amount of pips with, uh, within the, tra uh, the trading pair. So instead of doing just a straight up, I want pullbacks to happen and I want to capitalize on these moments within the trend. So those are what I'm looking for. And most pairs don't, or not, not all pairs function like this. Some of them have smaller pullbacks, their pullbacks are only, only a few pips. I want these pullbacks to be substantial within the 50 to 100 pips range. So if we do get caught, our grid money management will allow us to get out because of the trade, uh, because of the behavior behind the, uh, the pair that we're trading. Okay. So the best pairs that I've explored this on, uh, grid trading techniques, have been the pound Canadian dollar and the Aussie CAD. And it's not just because they have big pullbacks within uh, large move, moves, it's also because they uh, react to candlestick patterns uh, pretty fairly well as well. So inside candles, uh, bullish engulfing candles, uh, bearish engulfing candles, these kind of candlestick, uh, candlestick trading on these pairs is really quite effective. And it's because they're uh, not as manipulated as, say, for example, the euro US dollar or the pound US dollar. Uh, and so I find, find that uh, we can find candlestick patterns that really work. For example, like this bullish engulfing candle showing us that there was a clear rejection at the bottom here and a huge price movement up on the pound Canadian dollar. And that's what we're looking for. These are the kind of pairs that we're looking for uh, uh, this kind of behavior. And I wanted to show you real fast what this looks like um, is just basically this person here ran some data for Forex uh, average daily range. And it shows which pairs have the highest average uh, range, um, average daily range. So the top one on the list is the pound New Zealand uh, dollar. And I think that this pair I have explored, but the the, basically the broker's spread is always too high on this pair, making it really difficult to uh, grid trade on when we have multiple orders because we're paying too much out of pocket, uh, making it not make sense. I've also explored the, uh, the pound Aussie dollar, but you'll see that the CAD is pretty close to the top there. Um, it has been since 2014. It has a pretty big uh, range, daily range, and the Aussie CAD is also not on the top of the list, but it's, it's near the middle. And so these two pairs are the ones I focus on uh, because they show good range characteristics and they also obviously uh, bounce and uh, have large pullbacks in, within the range or even when trending as well. Okay, so you can see in my example what, what I was just talking about where we enter the market expecting to go down and the uh, market went against us or the pair went against us so we kept going up, 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 up we went on a grid and then it finally came down in a big way 
uh, right after that. And so these are the kind of things that we're capitalize on, capitalizing on and have been with the strategy for the last 10 plus years. Okay, so this is why I use these two pairs. Are they the only pairs that can trade grid trade successfully on? You, uh, no, you can actually use other pairs as well, like the New Zealand Canadian dollar. That's also a pretty good uh, range, ranging pair uh, that doesn't trend as as heavily as some of the others. And when it does trend, it does have those larger pullbacks that we're looking for. So not every single pair will do this. And that's why you need to kind of do your research uh, to see what's out there and find the pairs that will work best for your grid trading strategy. I think it's important to uh, to not just use grid trading mechanics uh, or money management to trade the market. You need some kind of strategy behind it so you're not constantly being pushed to your limits of your grid, okay? All right, so the next video that I'm gonna be going over uh, is focusing on the Ranger strategy, why it's profitable, the development behind it, uh, and um, where I see this strategy going in the future. So until then, see you guys in part three.